Okay, hello everybody. My name is Elena Dalibo. I'm from European Alternatives. Thanks a lot for giving us the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, I'd like to start by reading the opening uh, sentence in the introduction of this Citizens' Manifesto, which I'll discuss now. Uh, it reads, a 2013 report by the Red Cross highlighted that while other continents are successfully reducing poverty, Europe is the only one to be adding to it. The richest continent of this planet is also the one where most people have been falling below the poverty line in the th first three years of this decade. So, um, in recent years, the support to the um, unconditional uh, universal basic income, I'm sorry also for the mistake here, uh, well, should add the two use as it was said before. Um, this support has taken many forms. Uh, we've mentioned the, the European Citizens Initiative, um, but there are other, other initiatives, uh, all trying to put this issue on the political agenda and to make a change. So I will present one of these initiatives that we've run, um, European Alternatives, uh, going into the same direction, which is the Citizens' Manifesto. So um, a couple of words on uh, European Alternatives. It is a transnational organization promoting democracy, equality and solidarity beyond the nation state. And we organize a variety of uh, types of actions uh, ranging from campaigns and uh, projects to public events, a festival, the Trans Europa Festival, as well as some research and publication. Um, so this Citizens Manifesto, which I have here, is the result of uh, three years' work. Um, and it was a bottom-up, transnational and participative process, um, which so led to the elaboration of, uh, of this document that was presented to the European Parliament in December 2013. Uh, so it's divided in 12 different topics, as you can see, uh, one of them being welfare, so they are quite general general topics because we believe that uh, it's important if we want to, to imagine a new society to, to, to uh, study all these topics together because they are very much interlinked. Um, and one of, these one of the proposals um, in the manifesto, so on each topic we have uh, about five or six proposals, very concrete proposals for change that could be implemented in the short to midterm uh, at EU level. And one of these proposals is um, unconditional basic income at EU level. So the introduction of an unconditional basic income at the European level, that would be individual, not familial, universal, unconditional and high enough to cover the most fundamental basic needs, um, yeah, and it would be financed through different reforms on taxes uh, that would increase their progressivi progressivity. So maybe one specificity of this initiative is that this proposal is here together with a number of other ideas, and uh, it's not a comprehensive document, of course, uh, but the idea is that it, it could really be used as a stepping stone to start discussion um, with citizens on the ground, but also with decision makers. Um, so I'd like to explain to you now how um, we arrived there and where this proposal came from. I mentioned it was a participative process, so I'll explain to you um, what, what it was. So since 2011, we organized uh, consultations across Europe uh, to, to try and bridge the gap between people's concerns on the, on the ground um, and policymakers and um, reverse the idea according to which the answers should come from above because uh, the crisis is technical and we need experts to find solutions. We wanted to say no, we need to involve people, listen to them and listen to what they do on the ground. So you can see here a map of the different places where we organize consultations. 
um, sometimes several in, in each uh, city. So the topics bef uh, at the start were chosen on the, base on the basis of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the 2011 Stockholm Programme, which was the five-year plan proposed by the European Council um, and adopted by the Commission uh, relating to the Justice and Home Affairs acquis for the 2010-2014 period. Um, and it addresses new forms of cooperation and action uh, in the European Union. So we started with uh, six topics and then more were added uh, as we went. And the consultations organized at the local level were held in the local language using the World Cafe methodology and working with the local association, local authorities, so trying to be as inclusive as, as possible. Um, we we organized uh, one, for example, on uh, welfare in Berlin and we worked with uh, many participants uh, who were themselves uh, part of the heart fear uh, system so who were experiences experiencing precarity and so it was interesting to hear from them about dignity for example or the, f the feeling of being controlled through the the current system um, so this Manifesto, um, so this is the, the process, the different steps. We had the, these consultations, then we gathered people together in transnational forums, which were a bit less inclusive because they had to take place in, in English um, to, for c communication sake. Um, but the idea was to, to put the proposals together and see if there were any ideas that um, came back from different countries and different cities. And then once we had this num the, a number of proposals, uh, we organized research workshop workshops la last year to start developing the argumentation uh, behind the ideas. So the experts were helping citizens' ideas and not, not the opposite. Um, and we presented the manifesto to the European Parliament in December 2013. Uh, the process is going to continue now and so un up until the elections and even afterwards to advocate for these ideas um, so both towards the decision makers, the new newly elected parliament, uh, but also to continue to connect people who are doing lots of different initiatives on the ground but not necessarily working together at the European level. So with the Trans Europa caravans, uh, in two weeks we'll travel Europe. There will be six caravans um, traveling Europe, and we'll meet with initiatives uh, to to hear from them what they do. Uh, we'll meet notably some solidarity kitchens from uh, Greece in Katerini, um, and listen from them and discuss the manifesto with them. So, um, s and this is. This is uh, the trip uh, of the of the the caravans. So some more information about basic income, um, but I'll go fast because I think a lot of it was mentioned already. Um, and I also want to repeat that maybe unlike other speakers today, I'm not speaking from the position of an expert here, but rather um, a rapporteur of this process. So. Um, the idea of a basic income came in the in the consultations uh, from the the situation of high un unemployment rates, but also the uh, new newer situation of the working poor, the disengagement and disappointment of European citizens. Um, so all this led to the idea that a basic income would be maybe a solution. Um, so what kind of basic income? Um, it goes back to the definition uh, made by Ronald uh, before, so universal, unconditional, basic. I won't go back to the differences between uh, guaranteed minimum income and minimum wage, but I think we I can go faster on this. Uh, one point that we haven't mentioned yet and that I think would be interesting to discuss um, is how to finance it, because this is one of the main question when speaking to people who are not familiar with the, the idea of basic income. Um, so it 
there's uh, first of all the cutting of the costs related to the bureaucracy um, of the current systems in Europe, but other the rest of the costs could be found by different taxes, um, taxes on financial transactions, more effective action against uh, fiscal evasion and tax fraud, increased VAT on luxury products. There are plenty of ideas, um, and it would be interesting to hear also from from you. Um, so the because the universal basic income is very linked to the concept of, of tax justice and to the principle of progressivity on taxes um, and uh, the cost incurred by the universality and unconditionality of the uh, universal basic income are compensated by more selective and progressive income taxes so uh, my last point is um, to raise a few questions and maybe mention some answers, but open it also to, to the debate. Um, the first question is, is this a new idea? So it's important to have in mind that it's not. Um, it's uh, at least already in mid 19th century, the idea was already there with Charles Fourier. Um, and a number of, uh, of important figures also were uh, distributed to, to you earlier. The second question is, does uh, the EU have any competences to act on that field? Um, so no direct co uh, competence, but there are legal basis that the EU can uh, work on from the Treaty of the European Union, uh, the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. On, so on these basis, um, the uh, European citizens' initiatives have based also their demand and it has been accepted, so it's been recognized by the Commission that they have the power to do something. Um, there's also one other counter-argument that's often heard, wouldn't it en encourage people to stop working? Uh, so, and there are several arguments to think otherwise. The first one is that uh, it would have a positive effect on the economy globally because it would um, just free people from accepting low paid and alienating uh, jobs and have the effect of increasing salaries and foster entrepreneurship. Yeah, and uh, on the very last point, um, is it, isn't it a trying horse of neoliberal forces to dismantle further the welfare state. Um, Ronald already touched upon this. It very much depends on the level because there are also some neoliberal advocates of basic income. They don't necessarily call their proposal um, partial basic income. They call it basic income in some cases. Uh, but it's important really to, to discuss what level we're talking about. So to conclude, um, it's really... We talked about the crisis several times. It's really a crossroads, and this is also an opportunity to um, to, um, to to show that Europe could be at the avant-garde of a new experience, a new experiment, and we should we should go for it. There's an urgency to act, and I think to be concrete, also it should come both uh, from the connection of several people initiatives on the ground, so such, such as this initiative today, and also pushing towards uh, decision makers. So it's a shame that Gerald Efner is not here. I hope he joins. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Okay, so I've been asked to talk about uh, democracy and, and unconditional basic income. So it will start uh, theoretical. So the, 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 our friend in black, please don't, don't, don't worry, because I promise <laughs> I'll be progressively uh, landing on, on basic income, <laughs> and maybe pr progressively as well. We'll see. <laughs> well, I, th I think, um, yeah, if you can put the first slide, please. It, it's just four slides, so thank you. So I, I think uh, thinking about democracy requires first reflecting about the description we manage of, of what the world is of what social life is. F philosophers call this as uh, what kind of social ontology do we have. For instance, classical liberals and neoliberals and neoclassical economists, and the Troika, by the way, suggest that we humans are sets of preferences, right? I prefer apples to peaches. I prefer playing piano to, to, to playing football. I prefer being a wage-earning worker to uh, being uh, an employer because I am risk-averse 
while the, the, the employer is risk prone, etc. World is of, a, of an essentially psychological nature. What matters is our psychological relationship with objects and with other people. And when those preferences sets, we are, because we are prefer preferences sets, uh, which are floating around, match, if they match, we sign a contract, a labor contract, for instance. Now, if we manage such a psychological description of, of social life, which has to do with, ta with talents, with, with, uh, with tastes, with, with incentives, with preferences, etc., only, only, we don't, we don't need uh, public policy, neither unconditional nor conditional. We just need to let people float and meet and match and sign. The problem is that such a social, a social ontology is false. I mean, I mean it, it is partially false you know, because, of course, we prefer apples to peaches or, or, the, other, or, or the other way around. Of course, the, the world harbors preferences. Of course, it's evident. Of course, the world is also also psychological. But what I want to propose today is that we start by getting rid of such a description of social life and clearly assume one showing that apart from psychological relationships, the world is crisscrossed by a myriad of, of, uh, of forms of power relations, of bonds of dependence, and that this has to do, this has to do with a very differential access to the ownership or control uh, of resources, material resources, immaterial resources, etc. All emancipatory traditions that shaped modern and contemporary world uh, have shown uh, and claimed that. So if this is the case, and if we don't want that some individuals and groups depend on others to live, in, in, the, in the terms of Marx, if we don't want that the, 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 the dispossessed are forced to live with the permission uh, of other people, of those who own resources, we need to, politi to, to politically eradicate uh, those bonds of dependence, those relations of power, not to build, that's important, not to build a world made of isolated atoms, that's important, but one where all have a certain set of resources and where interdependence is based on autonomous decisions in everyday life. Well, as we'll see, uh, all this has to do with the definition of, of effective democracy I will propose, and I will suggest, um, and, and, and this has to do as well with the very reason why we need institutional devices such as basic income in order to promote and exercise on a daily basis uh, real democracy. So we can move on now to the second slide. Uh, and because I would like to, 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 to offer a very, a very short overlook of these power relations within contemporary Europe. This we know, but I think it's important in order to reflect on, on democracy. Well, as we all know, the neoliberal turn of capitalism has had first effects on workers. Um, we have had lab labor reforms that increasingly put workers at their employer's mercy. Employers can decide with less and less constraints what you do, when, where, with whom, how, and when you stop doing this. So em employers can get rid of you with less and less uh, restrictions, this we know. It has had and is having uh, dramatic effects on, on women. There's been a, an intensification of patriarchy-related social patterns because households, that is women, households, that is women, tend to assume more and more of the care-related tasks the state used to do or was expected to do, to put it in Spanish terms. Um, I come from Spain, Catalonia. That's, it's the same in terms of, of absence of a proper welfare state. The, 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 neoliberal, the, the neoliberal turn of capitalism has had as well effects in terms of an increasing authoritarianism. I mean, no precarization of people's life is possible without authoritarianism. We are witnessing the growth of open rep uh, repression. Um, this is very clear in the south of Europe, for instance, in my, in my country. But more generally, we, we, are, we are witnessing a growing distance between citizens and institutions. Um, in spite of, 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 of interesting possibilities we have. So in sum, I think we are facing the kind of social scenario, scenario Guy Standing uh, describes when he talks about the precariat as an emerging and increasing social class made not of people who individually and collectively control their lives, but of people who live lives, lives made 
of bits and pieces, as, as he says, um, bits uh, and pieces that, that escape their control. Bits and, bits and pieces of work, of time, of social relations that don't belong to ourselves. Clearly, and, can, and now we can, we can move, off, move on to the third slide, clearly this is a non-democratic social scenario because I suggest democracy shouldn't be understood as a mere passive selection of elites, of rulers, through the vote, but as a decision-making mechanism allowing people to collectively determine how to organize all aspects of their lives. First, at work, because you need to be empowered to exit that social relation with that arbitrary uh, employer, if you wish, but you, you should be enabled to do that. At work, again, because you need to be enabled to decide with some fellows whether you want to stop per performing wage-earning work for others and constitute a cooperative, self-managed, productive, pr productive space where you count, where you count with higher degrees of control uh, over what you do, where, when, how, with whom, etc. People call this workplace democracy. Good. Um, and uh, at home, that is at work again, because th that collective organization of all aspects of our lives very crucially includes the, capaci the capacity of women to obtain fairer division of tasks within the, re within, within the realm of uh, reproduction. We could uh, even call this household democracy. And within the political sphere, because either under direct democracy schemes or within an indirect uh, representative democracy, you need crucial resources like time and some initial endowments in order to make genuine choices with real effects. Hence, basic income, and we can turn into the, into the last uh, slide. The unconditionality of basic income confers upon individuals the relevant doses of bargaining power to say no, as Weiderquist would say, uh, say no in order to say yes, other yeses to other social relations we wish to have today, but we cannot because uh, we cannot develop because we, we, we must accept what is on offer out there. In effect, by guaranteeing our existence, basic income plays a crucial role when it comes to autonomously decide how we want to live in the workplace, in the household, and within, and within political institutions. Um, but I need to immediately add three closes, and I'm finishing. There are very small uh, closes, one minute each. And this connects with Ronald's uh, sec um, uh, presentation and the debate, uh, the following debate. Basic income is a ground, but in order to deploy its, de its democracy enhancing potentialities, it should be a substantial ground, at least high enough to cover individuals' basic needs. It is important for each society, I think, to identify uh, such a threshold and, and to confer resources at the level of that threshold. Below that threshold where you, start, uh, where you can start saying no uh, to say yes to what you really want for your life, below that, that, that threshold, uh, cash transfers let you increase your welfare but not your freedom or the democratic nature of your social relations. So basic income should be high enough to cover your basic, your, your basic needs. Otherwise, there's no gain of bargaining power, and that's the main link I'm doing between democracy and bargaining power. Of course, this does not, does not mean that we cannot plead for partial forms of basic income for many strategic purposes, and, and, and I think this is a debate we can have today, we, we, we can have today. But we must be aware that those partial basic incomes don't foster freedom and democracy as a basic income, as a, as a basic income at the level of the threshold does. The second clause has to do with the institutional context of basic income. I see basic income only as part of the ground that is, as a measure to, to be complemented by other measures, by unconditional welfare devices, and thinking on in-kind policies like public health, education, housing, care policies, a minimum, a minimum wage, which has been mentioned before. I mean, having to buy, to, to buy those services in the market can turn basic income, I'm, I'm almost finished, having to buy all this into markets can turn basic income into an, uh, into an irrelevant measure for, from the point of view of the democratization of social relations. For instance, we know that the price of private health 
insurances grows dramatically with risk. So if you, if you are an old person, for instance, the price of your health insurance can grow a lot and exhaust your basic income and ruin the bargaining power uh, we are saying that is so important. So I think we, we need to avoid neoliberal state substituting forms of basic income. The third clause had to do with the idea of the ceiling, the, the idea of, of controlling great accumulations of, 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 of private power. Uh, and uh, I, I think I will leave it for the discussion because uh, I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, and I stop. My, my, my main aim today was just to briefly show why something like a basic income, if these clauses are considered and implemented now or in the future, because we have progressive uh, ways to implement basic income sometimes, basic income, if these clauses are, are considered, can be seen as part of an, of, of, an, of an emancipatory strategy aiming at instituting the socioeconomic conditions of democracy.